Good morning. I'm Tim Hofer, President and CEO at the Empire Center. We're very glad to have all of you here today to take part in what we anticipate will be a very informative and hopefully prescriptive discussion. As many of you know, New York and the nation faced an unprecedented challenge when the coronavirus struck in early 2020. We know now that the early response was flawed in many ways. So now is the right time to take a step back and think about how we can be better prepared for the next time something like this happens. We'll start with Bill Hammond, the Empire Center Senior Fellow for Health Policy. Following that, we'll hear from each of our panelists and we'll leave plenty of time at the end for a discussion among the panelists and your questions from the audience. We'll be using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom panel to moderate those questions. We encourage you to start posting your questions at any time, but we'll hold them for the second half of the program. And with that, I'm happy to hand it over to Bill Hammond. Classic. Um, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, I especially appreciate the your interest in um, the state's public health system. It's a topic that kind of comes up. Uh, it, it's a system that kind of functions along, and when it's functioning well, we don't think about it. And then when there's a crisis, we we wake up to the fact that we have the system and how important it is. And that was especially true last year. Um, our focus today is, is obviously the 2020 pandemic. Um, it, it was a global pandemic, but it hit New York harder than many other places on the planet, especially in New York City. I mean, to this day, the, the, the mortality rate in New York City, it's about 4,000 per million. If, if New York City was its own country, that would be the third worst in the world behind Peru and Bulgaria and just ahead of Bosnia Herzegovina and and something that's that's based on primarily that's based on a, a two month period of time it was very a concentrated event just a just a horrendous spike unlike um, outbreaks seen almost anywhere else um, and we were all familiar with the basic explanations for why it got so bad in New York. One is it's a, it's a dense urban setting with a lot of uh, crowd-based activities and mass transit and tourism, a lot of visitors from all over the world. Another issue is that it happened so early. Uh, we, were, we were among the first major places in, in the U.S. certainly to hit. It's before we really knew how the virus worked. And, we hadn't really developed strategies for responding. Uh, and a third factor, obviously, the federal government was uh, dropping the ball in many ways, uh, especially when it came to testing. And so we were kind of blind to what was going on in New York. Um, I guess I would point out, though, that some of those factors they didn't necessarily determine the outcome. Like there were other places in the world that had dense urban areas and mass transit and tourism. There weren't that many of them, but there were some of those places that really defended themselves well and had a, rel a much milder pandemic than we did. Um, I guess another point I would make is that all of those things that we discussed, the urban density, the tourism, um, the, 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 the fact that we're gonna be on the front line of a pandemic because we have tourists coming from all over the world, and even our dependence on the federal government for intelligence and, and testing capability, all of that is still true now. It's just as true now as it was in January 2020. Nothing about those risk factors has fundamentally changed. And uh, I'm concerned that when the next pandemic arises, which could be at any time, hopefully won't be for many years, that we will be just as vulnerable when that happens as, as we were last year. Now, um, so later we're gonna be asking the panelists to make a proposal, you know, some idea that, that, that they think would improve our public health defenses against the next pandemic. I'm gonna make mine right now. And that is that I think we need uh, a formal investigation slash study of what happened last year. Um, it should be independent because 
so much of state government was kind of directly involved in what happened. It should be well funded. It should have lots of experts. It should have subpoena power. Um, I don't think it should be focused on crimes. I don't think it should be about recriminations. I think it should be about learning lessons and improving things for the future, looking at systems rather than individuals. Um, to, to give the context for why I think this is necessary, I'd like to throw up a few slides. Uh, so how do I... So this is the pandemic as we experienced it. Are, are, are you all seeing this? Okay, so this is the pandemic as we experienced it. What, what Governor Cuomo talked about as the mountain. Um, and it kind of started, we first became aware that this virus was in New York in early March. Um, the, the numbers started growing at this kind of horrific rate. And, and one thing that strikes me is that the number of infections, the number of hospitalizations are almost, they're moving in parallel and they're almost at the same scale. And that, that, that's a, a testimony to how blind we were, that basically we were waiting for sick people to show up at the hospitals. That's how we were, we were learning about what was going on with this wave. The governor ordered New York on pause, uh, the, the shutdown on March 22nd. And, the numbers just kept going straight up um, for another two and a half weeks until finally hitting a peak. And, and for, for all of that time, we really had no idea how high it was gonna go. We feared it was gonna go much higher than it actually did. And our fear about that drove, drove a lot of um, desperate decisions about um, a stat, you know, built, setting up emergency hospitals and, and uh, uh, famously shifting nursing home patients and uh, shifting hospital, shifting patients from hospitals into nursing homes. Um, but I want to show you another view of the same set of events. And that is this one. So what I've added to this, the, the mountain is still there at the bottom, the red and, and the solid blue lines. That, that is Governor Cuomo's mountain. But what I've added here is a projection, a reverse extrapolation of the actual rate of infection in the state. Um, this was created by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. I think I got the acronym wrong there. Um, sorry. The, so everything happened a month earlier than we thought it did. The virus arrived in early February. It was climbing at a pretty ferocious rate by late February. On the day we discovered, we first became aware that the virus was in the state on March 1. Um, at that point, the, the rate of increase was already 10,000 new infections per day and rising fast. Um, and what really strikes me is that the peak uh, was right around the same time that the shutdown happened. Um, it, these numbers are, are, are estimates. They're not super precise. You'll, it, it actually looks like the, the peak had already passed by the time the shutdown happened. I don't know that that's actually true. I, I tend to doubt it. But imagine how much different our experience of the pandemic would have been if we had known once we took that extraordinary step of like shutting down our lives, many of us, um, staying home, um, not going out to eat, not going to work, um, not sending our kids to school, um, the, the enormous disruption and, and the, 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 the upset that that caused, if we had known that almost as soon as we did that, the curve wasn't just flattened, it was crushed, it was plunging um, during that period when, when the hospitalizations were rising and the deaths were rising, the, the, the end of the uh, tunnel was already in view. But of, but of course we didn't know that because we had so little information about 
what was going on in terms of, you know, we had so little testing and so little surveillance that was giving us any good information. That period between the, the delay in ordering the shutdown ends up being the major factor explaining the number of deaths in New York State. Everything that happened, uh, all the other decisions that happened about you know, distribution of PPE or you know, sending hospital patients into nursing homes are really tiny by comparison to the consequences of that delay. Um, a Columbia study famously uh, estimated that shutting down a week earlier would have saved 17,500 lives. So what I think this commission needs to really focus on, uh, I think what we all need to focus on, is how do we shorten that delay? And not just the delay between the first confirmed case on March 1 and closing down on March 22. I mean, that alone is kind of distressing that it took that long. Um, but the delay from whenever it actually arrived in early February, uh, six or seven weeks went by where the virus was spreading. In, and, and by the time we were aware of it, it was already beyond the point where we could probably realistically control it. When you have 10,000 new infections a day, there's only so much contact tracing and quarantining you can do. How do you close that gap? How do you shorten that time frame? How do you get um, you know, quicker, more effective response? Well, it starts with better surveillance. Having, uh, you know, should we establish some kind of system for, for routinely, uh, uh, routinely scanning, say, for example, um, sewage waste for signs of viruses? I mean, I've seen people propose this. It sounds very ambitious. Um, it's something you maybe you, you didn't do all the time, but you would do when you knew there was a new virus on the horizon, you know, cropping up in China. Or maybe you uh, have some kind of system of routinely checking what's going on in emergency rooms and doctor's offices. I mean, we do that to some extent already. Maybe we need to, uh, you know, ramp that up, make it more sophisticated. Um, another factor would be preparation. Um, it turned, we had plans. We had uh, a stockpile, but it turned out that they were nowhere near adequate. The stockpile in particular, the Empire Center recently obtained records of what was in the stockpile on March. And um, how do I stop this? Okay, We, we obtained uh, records of what was in the stockpile and it turned out most of it was expired. 70% um, of the masks in the stockpile were past their expiration date. Many of them were more than five years past their expiration date. 40% of the ventilators were expired. And a bunch of the ventilators weren't in the stockpile. They'd been distributed to hospitals and they were being used. And it seems, it seems to me, I don't know exactly how that works, but it seems to me that defeats the purpose of the stockpile, which is to have a bunch of extra equipment on hand for emergencies. Um, uh, another factor that needs to be addressed apparently is communications between different levels of government and communications between say the city and the state and between the health department and the governor's office. Um, those didn't always function properly. And that um, I know there was at one point uh, health officials in New York city were desperately going outside the chain of command, trying to reach the city council, threatening to resign, th threatening to go to CNN as a way of getting the attention of the mayor. Um, it shouldn't have to work that way. And then I think you also want, you generally want the, the, the chief executives to have a, a better advice in front of them. Uh, and that includes having a better plan. Like they, they, they shouldn't be figuring out how to create emergency hospital space in the thick of the crisis. That should be something that's, you know, that should be a plan that's on the shelf and ready to go, it seems to me. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking as a, as a non-expert, a, a lay person, a, a former journalist. I'm throwing these things out to give you an idea of what I think that the investigation should look at. Um, we have had a number of investigations. They've been focusing on errors of commission, things that the governor did do that went wrong. There were some of those. Um, 
and and accountability is necessary. I I just think we need to remember that it was the errors of omission that were the biggest problem here. The thing the things and we didn't even know we were committing these errors because we were so blind to what was going on. Uh, and I, uh, as we said at the outset, we're a we're a we're a dense state, especially downstate. We have really dense population. We have um, a lot of tourists coming in, more or less guarantees that a virus anywhere in the world is gonna make its way here eventually. Um, and uh, so I think we, we need a better public health system, better pandemic defenses than places that don't have that urban density and don't have that level of tourism. Final point I would make is, um, uh, this pandemic has exposed inequities in our society. You had certain populations that suffered way more than others. You had elderly nursing home residents, you had um, people of color, the low income people, essential workers. Um, if you want to save those lives, the best and most effective thing you can do is improve the, the pandemic response. If so, for example, if you close down a week earlier, 17,500 lives were saved. The, the disproportionate share of those 17,500 lives would be precisely those same vulnerable groups. Um, so at the, by the same token, if you're concerned about the economic damage that was done, again, disproportionately to people at the low end of the spectrum, this is also the most effective way to, to, to prevent that in the first place uh, is, a, is better awareness and better response to uh, viral threats. So that's, that's my, um, my opening statement um, and we can now go to the panel. Thanks, Bill. So we're gonna start with um, Dr. Burkett, who's a professor emeritus at the School of Public Health uh, at the University of Albany. Uh, before that, he spent um, 27 years at the New York State Department of Health, uh, ending there as the Deputy Commissioner for Public Health Programs uh, around 2015, I believe. Um, so Dr. Burkhead, we're going to just do some quick presentations on, as Bill discussed, uh, proposals that you think will help us move this forward. So we're happy to hear from you. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for the opportunity to participate in today's session. Uh, I think it's particularly important to understand the lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic response so far. Uh, and I would just point out that uh, as recent events have shown, the pandemic is not over. Uh, and so I think we need to also be focusing on what we can do today to, to really improve our, our response going forward. Um, so, uh, I agree that uh, a review of what happened at the beginning it would be useful. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to really get into the thick of that today. Um, but uh, I would also uh, echo Bill's comment uh, uh, that, that this is not should not be about assessing blame um, as to what happened um, and uh, certainly not uh, a sort of unfortunate use of the word criminal, I think, Bill, in your comment. Uh, so I think that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about trying to understand what happened and why decisions were made uh, the way they were made. And I think that's maybe difficult to sort of, to sort of tease out uh, in retrospect. Um, so I, I wanted to focus a little bit on what I think some of the current current issues are that impact what's happening, uh, you know, in our response today. Uh, and some of these some of these, I think, impacted our, our response in the beginning. One, one of the most pressing needs right now, I think, to address uh, is to address New York's current and future pandemic preparedness um, is is really the rebuilding of the state's public health infrastructure. Um, Sarah Ravenhall from NYSECHO in a minute will talk about the challenges at the local health department level. I, I can focus on the needs at the state level. I, I think if there's any silver lining in this pandemic, it's, it may be that policymakers and the public now have a clearer understanding of what we, ha what we have as a public health system, that we have, that there actually exists a public health system even, and what that system does, uh, at least as far as battling an infectious disease pandemic. Um, 
But this public health system has really, has really suffered greatly during the pandemic with increasing numbers of professionals leaving the state workforce due to the stress of the perpetual emergency response, as well as the stresses created by the internal and external working environments. Uh, but in fact, that, that loss of staffing was only accelerated uh, by the pandemic. It existed uh, well in advance of the pandemic. And I think one of the aspects of our of our preparedness uh, at the beginning, I think we need to look at is how, how uh, robust was our public health system at that time. Uh, dating back as far as the 2008 financial crisis, there's been a, a loss of public health workforce uh, at the state level, at the local level. Nationally, I think it's estimated that uh, public health workforce declined by 60,000 workers uh, following the financial crisis. Uh, and these losses have been felt in New York uh, with reductions in state staffing in community health and environmental health at the Wadsworth Laboratory um, that really predate the pandemic and were already potentially having an impact at the time that the pandemic uh, hit. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important to note uh, that, uh, that those, position, those lost positions not only undoubtedly impacted the ability to, of the state to respond to the pandemic, um, but also to carry out all the other uh, unsung bread and butter public health work that, uh, that Bill mentioned uh, to prevent, for example, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, HIV, tobacco and drug addiction, addressing poor mental health, environmental exposures, health disparities and health equity, uh, these are all things that a public health system does, and it was it was compromised already at the time that uh, the pandemic began. And so the ability, for example, to 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 think about health disparities and and health equity in the in the midst of the pandemic was hampered by by you know lack of of staff and programs uh, working in those areas that that also prevent pre help prevent other diseases. Um, so when the pandemic is finally over, these problems, these other public health problems will still be huge, uh, but very preventable burden on our society. So I think what's needed now is really a recognition of the importance of the public health, but, uh, public health, both the staffing and the resources uh, that protect the health during a, during a pandemic, but also during non-pandemic times uh, and take steps, concrete steps to reverse that decline. Um, and I think it's also important that people working be able to work in the most supportive environment that they can that they can work in. Um, one positive step recently has been the announcement by the state of a New York State Public Health Corps uh, and a similar program in New York City. Using federal money, the plan is to hire outside of the city at least a thousand public health workers and place them in one to two year fellowships at the state and local health departments and community organizations and. This has great potential. Uh, actually, interesting as in my position now in public health education, I know that there's a huge interest now in both college level uh, public health majors and minors, as well as graduate level public health degrees. Um, and uh, so there's, there's the pandemic, I think, has paradoxically uh, gotten younger people interested in working in this area. So. But the, but the public health core is, is just a one to two year fellowship program. If it's really gonna be made sustainable, the state really starts needs to start now planning to take over and continue that program when the federal funding runs out, uh, including building it into the state's financial plan now for the next couple of years. Uh, another positive step would be to carry out the state to carry out its commitment to build a new Wadsworth laboratory. Uh, something that was about ready to launch when the pandemic hit. Wadsworth was a bright spot, I think, in the early response. It was the first laboratory outside of the CDC to get FDA approval for its COVID test. And its staff has performed countless uh, tests as well as uh, helping commercial labs get up and, and running their, their testing in the early days then. Um, so in a sense, we may have had a, a bit of a leg up, but. Um, Wadsworth still needs, at that time even was recognized, needed a more up-to-date facility. Uh, its staffing had been being reduced. Uh, and so I think there are benefits. Uh, there was a plan to develop a new laboratory, which we should go ahead with, because that's gonna be our preparedness for the next 
for the next go around if we if we experience this again or if the current pandemic even gets worse with with changing strains and and variants uh, occurring so and and i think there would also be benefits in integrating that new lab facility with the school of public health uh, at the university at albany finally i'll just make a couple of comments uh, about uh, you know the possible new wave of infections due to omicron um, in reading from reading press reports, there seemed to be less enthusiasm amongst policymakers these days for returning to lockdowns and mandates as a way to control pandemic waves, even though that may have been, you know, the, one of the most effective uh, measures taken uh, early on. And unfortunately, the polarization around those issues is, is pretty great. Um, and so we need to think about doing a better job of, tr of trying to encourage the use of the other tools at our disposal, such as the consistent universal wearing of masks with or without mandates. Uh, to do this, we need to really have a much better impactful communication strategy and campaigns, including TV and social media to combat the polarization that exists on these issues and to try and normalize the use of, of these control measures across society, because we, we could be, you know, if Omicron is really as bad as, as it potentially could be, we may be right back in the same sort of a situation uh, pretty quickly. And the measures that we used before may, may not be as acceptable to people because of this polarization. I think that's something we really need to focus on. And certainly for the next pandemic, um, I don't know what, what the willingness of policymakers to embark in shutdowns again will be given, given the sort of the negative uh, uh, around that. Um, and finally, I do, I do agree that I think it would be helpful to instilling public confidence to have a fully transparent advisory process providing recommendations to the government. It was not clear uh, who was providing advice or what advice that was in the past. And so having, having some way of making that process more visible, I think could help improve public confidence. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the further discussion. Great, thank you. Uh, Senator Gottfried, uh, who is the, I believe, the longest serving member of the legislature, also happens to be the chairman of the Health Committee, so particularly relevant to this discussion. Um, his role in the legislature has included a lot of things, including um, the medical marijuana law, HIV testing, confidentiality laws. I mean, we could go on and on. Um, so Assemblyman, if, if you could give us your proposal, we'd be very appreciative. Well, thank you, and thank you to Empire Center for doing this. Uh, you know, one quick piece of history, uh, about seven years ago, uh, when Ebola was the world's focal point, there were, I think it was a total of two cases in New York City, and that was it. Uh, there was a lot of fear that it could become a real epidemic, uh, highly contagious, highly uh, deadly disease. Um, and yet it got locked down very quickly in New York. And I believe an awful lot of the credit, maybe all the credit for that, goes first to the city health department uh, with a century and a half long tradition of, uh, of real excellence in public health uh, and the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, you know, the one hospitalized case was not at at one of our world-class uh, academic medical centers. Uh, he was treated at Bellevue uh, and they did a magnificent job. Um, and I, I, I think we have those two pieces of a public system, the health department and, uh, and, and the, the city public hospitals uh, to thank for Ebola not becoming uh, what could have been a, a, a massive horrendous uh, event. Uh, Right now, I think there are a couple of things we need to do. Uh, one, and there will be a lot of discussion of this uh, today, uh, you know, the state funding under what is called Article 6 of the Public Health Law, state funding for local uh, uh, city and county health departments uh, has been dramatically cut in recent years uh, during, you could say, particularly the, the 10 years of the Cuomo administration. Uh, Funding for New York City was especially hard hit, uh, which you could attribute in part to the, the, the then running contra, you know, fights between uh, the governor and the mayor. Uh, 
but we need to restore the strength of our of our local uh, health departments. And what the state can and should do is is restore that Article Six funding. Uh, at the state level, I think the health department has suffered serious deterioration and was in a downward spiral well before uh, COVID uh, hit. Uh, you had serious understaffing in terms of quantity of staff uh, for years before COVID, uh, and, and it was worsening. And you had a, a very serious brain drain from the Department of Talented People, uh, whether you want to say being driven out or, or, or leaving in frustration. Uh, I think the, the fact that uh, so much decision making was, was taken away from the health department and focused in the, uh, in the governor's office uh, and, and the, the, the lack of adequate funding and support for the state health department. Uh, at the same time, we were dismantling funding for local health departments. Uh, I think took a terrible toll uh, on the state health department. And we're gonna have to restore its funding uh, and staffing levels, uh, restore its professionalism and independence. You know, I don't know how you pass a law that says that the that the governor should give a lot more respect and 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 and, and leeway to the state health department and not try to undermine it. Hard to pass a law that says that, uh, but I, I I think unless Governor Hochul makes a real turnaround in how the health department has been treated uh, for the last decade, uh, we're going to be in in increasing trouble. Last thing to quickly mention, I, I think the idea of a of either a state or a national commission uh, to look into uh, into the whole Ebola situation not Ebola, a uh, COVID situation, um, I think is really needed. Uh, people have made comparisons to the 9-11 commission. Uh, I think there's a lot we could learn uh, from that kind of effort and prepare better for the future. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Ravenhall is the executive director of the New York State Association of County Health Officials, um, representing local health commissioners and public health directors across New York. Um, Sarah, we're happy to hear from you. Thank you so much, Tim, and thank you, Bill. Um, I've been in my role at the New York State Association of County Health Officials, or what we call NYCHO, for about four years now, and I've led my membership through the COVID-19 pandemic. And I can confidently say I represent some of the most brilliant and studied public health experts in the nation. It's been such a, a pleasure to see how passionately they lead their departments and have led them during the COVID-19 emergency. So Bill, your recommendation is, is spot on. In the public health sector, following a public health emergency, we conduct what we call a debrief or an after action report so that we can look back, see what worked well, where the gaps existed in the emergency response structure, and they then make plans for how we can improve into the future. Um, and, and so I'm very glad we're having this conversation today. Uh, with the governor declaring a public health emergency last Friday, and the news about the South African Omicron variant, now is really the time for us to focus on rebuilding, infusing our public health infrastructure with much needed resources, so that we can reach a place where we can adequately respond to ongoing emergencies, as well as deliver um, core public health services to our state's communities. Um, and New York State's public health system is comprised of world-class public health experts, and but it's in crisis, really. And numerous elements have intersected to weaken the public health response infrastructure over time. Um, our workforce, public health workforce in New York State, it's made up of public health nurses, disease control investigators, sanitarians, community health workers, and other professionals. Um, they're responsible for preventing disease and protecting the health of New Yorkers and keeping our community safe. Um, now, most of the staff in the state's local health departments, they work to deliver one or more um, of, of six core public health services. So those six include um, doing a community health needs assessment, um, providing communi uh, communicable disease control, chronic disease prevention, maternal and child health services, emergency preparedness services, 
And in 31 out of 58 of the local health departments, um, full service local health departments provide env environmental health services. So those uh, core responsibilities are set forth in, uh, in statute and they're known as Article VI services. Um, over the past five years in New York State, uh, the number of local health department staff delivering these core services has declined. And according to data from the State Department of Health, the number of full-time employees working on those services, those Article VI services, but, uh, it declined by about 7% between 2015 and 2020. During the same period, the population of the state of New York increased by 3%. So you can imagine that the reduction in staff has made it really, really challenging for those local health departments to address um, public health challenges, including um, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And on top of all of this, um, NYSHO recently partnered with SUNY Oneonta, Bassett Healthcare Network Research Institute to do a survey. Um, it indicated, with no surprise to us, that public health workers have been subject to targets of protests and um, have really experienced overwhelming burnout in responding to the pandemic over the past um, two years. So uh, of the 209 public health workers who completed that survey, we know that 90.4% of them felt overwhelmed by the workload, 75.6% felt disconnected from family and friends because of the workload, 65% felt unappreciated at work, and over half of the respondents reported experiencing stigma or discrimination during the crisis. So, uh, you know, one of NYSHO's recommendations is to protect and retain the dedicated workers employed by local health departments. Um, and to do that, we really need to make investments uh, into Article 6 state aid funding. And making those investments is going to protect and ensure longevity in our state's public health workforce. Um, we also know that the state is approaching a loss of decades upon decades of public health expertise through local retirements. Um, we ran a survey of our members recently and 42 local health departments responded. They reported in 2020 that um, 1,257 local health department employees statewide were eligible for retirement. So that's, that's very concerning information. Um, and of those uh, uh, 1,257, 743 were from New York City and 514 were rest of state. So that those numbers represent a total of 20%, 22% of the total workforce statewide eligible for retirement in 2020. So, um, you know, given all of this, the state's uh, decade plus history of dis disinvestment and erosion of the public health um, workforce has left a little opportunity for succession planning, development of the next generation of public health professionals, and local governments are going to be hard pressed to address the retirements and um, staffing shortages under the current Article 6 funding structure. So um, we know a lot of emergency funding has, has come into us, and for that we're grateful, but it's important to consider that public health emergency funding doesn't sustain the public health workforce. Um, we need long-term sustainable funding for this. And all of these factors culminate in a perfect storm, or rather the perfect time to fund our local health departments being via um, increasing the appropriation article six funding. And our success in doing that is really predicated on the commitment of um, lawmakers, non-traditional partners, and, and really the public in supporting this really important ask. And so that is our kind of the foundation of our recommendation. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it today. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Um, Senator Serino is in the 41st district representing Dutchess or parts of Dutchess and Putnam counties, has been there since 2015. Um, Senator Serino, uh, you're, so you're the ranking member on the Senate Aging Committee. Um, so we're happy to hear from you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bill. And I really want to thank the Empire Center for hosting this incredibly important conversation. And I really want to especially thank you, Bill, for all that you've done to date when it comes to forcing some transparency from the state and examining the state's overall response. And as you mentioned, I currently serve as a ranker on the state Senate's aging committee. And as you know, I've been an outspoken voice for vulnerable seniors throughout the pandemic, especially for the residents of New York's nursing homes and residential health care facilities and their families. I've also been a proponent of 
and maybe a bit of a broken record when it comes to pushing for a full independent medical and scientific review of the state's overall handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, but especially as it relates to the policies that impact these residents in particular. And while that's a big proposal that I'm backing today, I think that's something that, you know, especially from listening to everybody that we all agree on. So I also want to propose a couple of smaller initiatives as well. You know, and first of all, every year we hold a series of budget hearings. And unfortunately, I don't think they really get the attention that they deserve. You know, due to their length, they tend to be rushed and we don't always get to go in depth on issues that we know really matter. So in talking with Bill, one idea that he really helped me flesh out is separating the health budget hearings, which I think is awesome. The legislature should hold one hearing solely focused on Medicaid, which tends to dominate much of the health hearing, and another to focus on the overall state of the public health system, including its pandemic readiness. Doing this could give some important issues that kind of tend to get lost in the mix, um, much more focus. For example, in the midst of the pandemic, the state actually continued its trend of cutting financial support for nursing homes and assisted living facilities at a time when they were pummeled by the pandemic. And that cut felt like barely a blip on the public's radar, but it had been so detrimental to those who depend on the services. The other proposal I would like to put forward is a required legislative briefing by the executive and the Department of Health whenever a state of emergency order is issued. You know, throughout the pandemic, the communication with both was incredibly one-sided, and there was no indication that any of the concerns that we brought forth were actually taken seriously. And any time a, a state of emergency is triggered, the governor and the Department of Health, or whether it be transportation or DEC, whatever agency is lead on the issue, should have to brief the legislative leaders, both majority and minority, as well as the committee chairs and rankers for the impacted issue areas. And I think the briefing should be joint. The majority and the minority should be getting the exact same information and the opportunities to hear the questions and answers raised by both simultaneously. You know, throughout the pandemic, I wrote over 30 letters to the former Governor Cuomo trying to get answers to questions that our community had on everything from policies impacting nursing home residents and staff to needed fixes to the unemployment system to vaccination rollout uh, to policies impacting local small businesses and more. To date, I have not received a single response. We had regional calls during the weeks with representatives from the governor's office, but those calls were really very one-sided and rarely did we receive answers to questions proposed there. And that was so important. Uh, you know, Whether a governor likes it or not, lawmakers are elected to be the voice for those that they serve. And we're accountable to these residents. To not be able to get the answers to the basic questions is unacceptable. And this process really needs to change to improve the pandemic or any crisis response. Great. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. Thank you. So um, we're going to move now into the discussion and Q&A part of this. We've got questions coming in. So audience, please feel free to keep throwing them in there. We're going to mix them in um, as we continue the discussion. I'm going to start off because um, Bill said I could have the microphone, so I do. So uh, Sarah, first for you, thinking about when the vaccine came out during the rollout of that, um, you know, the, the, the counties had been tasked with and developed and practiced their own mass vaccination rollout plans that when push came to shove, um, essentially weren't used, right? The state came in and the hospitals took over that process. And I'm sure you have lots of reactions and your members have lots of reactions to that. I'd just be curious to get sort of both sides of it. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of effort that went into putting those things into play and there probably were some things that would have worked better with them and maybe the hospitals did some things that actually worked out better than anticipated. So could you expand on that a little bit for us? Yeah, thanks, Tim. I, I certainly do have a lot of um, opinions on that. Um, <laughs> local, so local health departments actually receive federal and state funding to help prepare them for emergency response. They've been doing this for decades. They've been ramping up, preparing for this type of public health um, event for, for a long time. And they're really good and have successfully navigated outbreaks previously, even before COVID-19. Um, they conduct annual drills. Um, they hold mass vaccination points of distribution, they're literally the best at what they do. And um, 
you know, rightfully the state wanted the healthcare workers who have been our healthcare heroes throughout all of this, and they continue to be, to be the first in line to get get those vaccines. So that that's absolutely understandable. But I, I you know, localities weren't brought to the table in the approach. And instead, the vaccine hubs were set up through the hospital systems. And if I, I, I truly believe that if our members had been involved in the planning, um, the executive would have seen that we have this already um, existing infrastructure in place. And, and it really wasn't an official model for organizing the response because the hospitals were very, very busy taking care of patients. Um, and, and we know that the models that the local health departments have in place work because we've been utilizing them, like I said, for a long time. Um, New York City and Rockland County has recently responded to um, the measles outbreak. And our for, full service counties are constantly responding to um, you know, hepatitis A outbreaks and food, service, uh, food handlers and uh, vector borne diseases, for example, rabies or um, um, triple E encephalitis is something that they're really used to responding to. So this is nothing that's new to us. And, and further from a local health department standpoint, once local health departments were brought into the process with COVID-19 vaccine distribution, um, they quickly stood up and implemented their existing plans. And we're very proud of the outstanding and ongoing work that they're doing to vaccinate their communities against COVID-19 with a focus on health equity. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, and, and maybe just building a little bit on your last comment, as long as I've got you and, and other panels, feel free to jump in. Um, please interrupt me as those of you who know me know, I'll just, I'll talk through the whole thing. Um, the state matches under Article 6 certain health expenses that come out of the counties, um, but not all of them. And that is that part of what creates, I mean, everybody's sort of railing on this idea of, you know, we need more funding. So when we look at where counties and where the departments are, are suffering for funding is part of that in the disparity of what is and what is not um, matched at the state and or federal level? Thanks, Tim. Uh, I, I believe you're talking about the ineligible expenses that are um, listed under Article 6. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's a variety of ineligible expenses, um, the most significant being fringe expenses for employees. It's interesting. Local health departments are one of the only local agencies where fringe is not an allowable ex expense under their state aid. And that does, um, along with the tech tax cap out, outside of the, uh, New York City, really create barriers in being able Able to a uh, hire locally. Um, so that's what we're looking at moving into next budget season um, session, um, really asking for a restructure of Article 6 to allow Fringe to be um, eligible under, under that state aid mechanism. Assemblyman Gottfried or Senator Serino, do either of you have any thoughts on, on that proposal? Yeah, I I don't see any justification for not covering fringe benefits uh, as part of an expense. It, it, it's an expense. Uh, it, if you don't provide fringe benefits, you don't get employees. Uh, I think there are actually, I mean, there are a variety of ways to, to calculate how to bump up the, the Article 6 spending, uh, whether you do it through fringe, uh, the, including fringe benefits or, uh, or just increasing the the funding for the pieces that we currently fund, it all comes down to more money. And uh, I think, I think that's, that's gotta be a, a part of this coming year's budget. Um, you know, you were asking earlier about uh, local vaccination plans. Uh, you know, at, at this point where we may be tending to forget the experience where when the vaccine program first began, uh, people were, people who wanted to be vaccinated were having a great deal of trouble finding uh, a, a place to go, find getting an appointment. Uh, and months into this process, when things were still not uh, well organized, I remember several occasions where I or others would ask the health department, what about uh, doing you know, pop-up sites at uh, public housing developments? What about doing this? What about doing that? And uh, the answer was almost always, well, we're looking at that. And I kept saying, wrong verb tense. I want to hear that you have looked at that already. Uh, and, and where is it? Uh, 
and it, you know, one of the points I made was that, you know, by the time the vaccine was created, people knew for about a year that a vaccine was going to be coming. We didn't know exactly when it would arrive, but we knew a vaccine was coming. And we knew that when it came, there would be a tremendous uh, need for a massive effort to get those vaccines into people's arms. Uh, and yet it doesn't seem like uh, the, the state health department was working on preparing uh, for what they knew was coming and certainly didn't turn to the local health departments who we have been paying for years to develop emergency plans, certainly didn't turn to local health departments and say, what have, what have you got in the works? Uh, and as a result, you had people who wanted to get vaccinated uh, spending months trying to, trying to find uh, a place and, a, and an appointment. Yeah, and um, Bill, I think Assemblyman Gottfried, you know, hit the nail right on the head with this too. And, you know, a lot of this oil boils down to communication from, you know, that could have, their things could have been managed so much better. You know, I remember when our local health departments, um, even we have a vacant JC Penny, right. And they use that as a vaccination distribution site, which worked out so well, but some of those things like um, assembly, the assemblyman had mentioned about the pop-ups could have happened if there was more communication, more working together, you know, the, let more of the locals be involved. And I think on uh, the other part of this too, is that we, we really have to work harder to retain quality staff. That's part of the problem. You know, when you think about when your families um, put somebody in a nursing home, they expect them to be safe and well cared for and that they don't have to worry about everything. And, you know, and look at what transpired. This was really hard. And I think we have to really work harder on retaining that quality staff and, uh, and providing uh, what the nursing home and uh, healthcare facilities uh, really need. And I think that the local uh, health departments too, with their staff can be are so critical uh, to helping us. So thank you. So, um, you know, uh, this, the assemblyman said the, the health department didn't seem to, to have thought some of this stuff through. And I think actually, I mean, it's a little unclear what the health department had thought through and hadn't thought through. But what is clear is that the governor's office, you know, whatever planning had happened, the governor's office was was not interested or, you know, they want they wanted to build their own plan. And they, I mean, there was an episode that just came out of the, the testimony from, I believe it was the attorney, the attorney general's investigation, where an official in the health department was describing being given the assignment. Um, it was something like, uh, you need to deliver 40 million vaccine doses in seven days, you know, and give us a plan to do that, like some ridiculously ambitious plan. I mean, I guess I sort of like the ambition. I like the idea that that somebody wanted to get it done that quickly. But they kind of threw this at the health department, said, come back with a plan. And I don't think that's the right way to use the people in the health department. The the you know the health you should be listening to the health department, not telling them what to do, but you know, in general. Um, and so it's a weird mix. There were some parts of our plan didn't exist or were inadequate, but then we did have other plans that may have been fine and we disregarded them. And I'm not sure, like, that's a, that's a tricky thing. How do you, I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent here. I just said we should have plans, but if you have an elected official when the moment comes, decides to disregard all of the planning. I don't know how you deal with that. I don't know what the, I, don't, I really don't know what the solution is to something like that. Maybe I could just chime in. I think, I think it's, this is an area that would be helpful to sort of understand the thinking because in a, in a crisis, uh, you know, I think it was Eisenhower was famously quoted as saying, plans are worthless, planning is, essential. And so the minute a crisis happens, the plan that's been sitting on the shelf starts to change. It has to change in response to facts on the ground. So I don't, I'm not defending any decision that was made or not made, but I think to understand what, what was considered, what the considerations were, 
would be helpful to, to prepare, you know, for the next, for the next go round. Um, the plan around vaccinations clearly had been all along involved the county health departments. Why, why was that not what, uh, what uh, ultimately happened? What were the factors that went into that? So again, I'm not defending the decision. I think the right, in my opinion, the right approach would have been to go with the county health departments because that was you know, tried and true. And they had developed plans to do, to do pop-ups or to do, to, they knew their communities, uh, whereas large hospital systems covering multiple counties might not have the level of detailed information. And I think what ultimately happened is the hospitals ended up reaching out to their county health departments for help because they didn't know how to do this. And they were, by the way, taking care of COVID patients at the same time. So, but I, I think to understand, you know, plans are, are, are a good thing to have, but I think we need to recognize that in, in the heat of, of a, a crisis, uh, it's almost expected that plans will change, have to change based on other considerations that, that were not part of the planning assumptions. And I, we, that's, that's where it would be useful to sort of understand why, why plan A was not what we went with and plan B was you know, what, uh, what we ended up doing. And I, I think to understand that is, is you know, what the decision-making process was would be helpful to, for the future. Because we may end up having to do this again and you know, hopefully we'll have learned something from this episode. So building off of that, Dr. Burkhead, um, I mean, you, you've, everybody's alluded to um, sort of what seems like some underfunding in, in health and public health infrastructure. When you were at the Department of Health, as you said, you saw it sort of this declining, nipping and talking of the budgets and getting smaller. And, and so obviously there were plans and there were ways you had, you had planned to respond to public health crises. What kind of impact did that have? I mean, specifically during coronavirus, as you saw, I know it was from the outside, but as you saw that where maybe things had been better funded before, or where the where the budget had supported programs, were there actual things, thinking about what we can learn from now, where those sort of nips and cuts and on the budget end had an impact on our ability to respond to coronavirus? Well, I'm not sure that I can give you, you know, concrete examples. Uh, when when cuts happen, they're often not; uh, they don't occur purposefully. People retire, and you're not able to refill the position in whatever program. So it's sort of the the, the reductions don't happen in in one particular program area. They're generally across the board. So it's hard to point to one thing that might have happened differently. Um, you know, in the communicable disease area, it, to have had more staff around who had experience with contact tracing might might have might have might have been helpful. Or with with surveillance, uh, I think they were pr probably pretty stretched thin pretty quickly uh, to be able to 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 respond in those areas. And in the immunization area, you know, the back the vaccine bean folks. I don't know what whether their staffing particularly was down. Most of our vaccine effort in New York is funded by the federal government. Um, so, uh, but I, I, think, I think, you know, the sum total of that across the department and particularly when you're gonna start pulling people from other program areas is you, you've, in a, in a crisis uh, um, that uh, you know, you're, 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 you're short staffed and you have people with less experience in the areas that you're talking about. So that's gonna, I think probably have an impact, but I think it's hard to put your finger on exactly what, what that impact was. Well, and, and so, I mean, that all these things seem to lend themselves to warranting for the study. And so as, as Bill's suggestion, I think I've heard most of you say you think it's a good idea to do sort of a postmortem on what happened during the coronavirus to have an independent commission to study these issues. Um, Assemblyman Gottfried, I, I, I mean, I think I heard you say before you support that idea um, and, and we appreciate that but it hasn't happened yet. So, I mean, what, what do you see as sort of holding this up at this point? I know the pandemic's not over, but here we are, I think as Dr. Burke had said, you're, we're staring down a micron and we don't know what that's going to look like. I think it would be helpful if we had some of those answers now, have this process sort of move quickly if it's going to. So from your perspective, I mean, what sort of stands in the way of that? How do we move it forward faster? Well, you know, part of the problem with getting a commission put together and getting funding for it is that, you know, it's not 
two two big obstacles. One is whoever is in power at the moment is going to worry that the commission is going to make them look bad. Uh, now, since we've got a, a new governor who doesn't have to worry about defending uh, what happened in, you know, before she became governor, uh, you know, that's a little less of a, of a, of a factor. Uh, but the other factor is spending the money on it. Uh, when you've got immediate needs, whether it's, you know, uh, not being able to fund adequate home care workers through Medicaid or uh, wanting to have more funding for, for state and local public health efforts, uh, putting money into, uh, into a study operation uh, is just politically hard to, hard to get support for. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged that there is apparently discussion at the national level. Uh, you know, I, I hear various senators and representatives talking about putting together a 9-11 commission. And it may, I, it may well make more sense to do this at a, at a national level, um, although I think there's also a case to be made for New York State doing it because our, our experience is in some ways unique uh, from the experience of a lot of other states. You know, we, we, were, we were the early hotbed of the, of the epidemic. Uh, we took a lot more actions uh, than many other states have done, and it, it's worth looking at how those actions worked. Um, but I, I, I think the, the key problem in getting such a thing put together is the politics of putting, uh, putting funding into a commission uh, when there are so many other demands for money in the budget. Oh, can I add something too, Bill? Please. You know, Yep, you know, right now we have immediate needs, but we also have a funding surplus at the state right now. Um, and that's why I think now is the time to do it. It's a smart investment to make. And I think the one thing that I think is important is building the public support for an initiative like this. Like they're, they want to be able to trust us, you know, and that's why I've been calling for this independent um, investigation. And, you know, it could proceed like the governor could appoint special counsel to lead this investigation and she can ensure the politics absolutely stay out of it by looping in the majority and the minority leaders to agree, agree on a, a pick. Like we could have a DA from another state or a former attorney general would be someone with the skills and independence, I think necessary to lead you know, such a commission. So there are ways that we can do this. And I, I think especially now with that surplus of money, people need answers and we need to know, you know, we can't say a matter of uh, if it's gonna happen or when it, we know something else is gonna, this keeps on going, this pandemic, we need to be prepared. And I think we need to find out where we went wrong. So we do it better the next time. Yeah. So um, as we continue to think about the planning aspect of this and learning from what happened, part of what I think we need to be prepared for, and, and this happened, I guess, with stockpile and, and, and post or past planning opportunities, it seems like it's more likely to happen now where we can, we can add infrastructure and funding and build some of these programs back up. And then as you get further away from whatever the inciting factor is, um, the political will and capital sort of dies down and it gets harder to keep them funded. And that's why we end up in this cycle. Um, so thinking about, and, and I would pose this to everybody on the panel who's dealing with it in a different way, um, how do we keep that political will and capital alive so that we don't end up in this same cycle, so that we don't end up making the investments to learn from this mistake. And then as it gets farther away, we see a sort of divestment there. Um, and so, and whoever wants to field that first, I think this is one of the most important things we can probably get through is, is how do we not end up where we are right now? So a prime example of what you're talking about, I'm, I'm on, right? Yeah, but the prime example is, is the stockpile. The stockpile was created, I believe it was in 2006. Um, there had been I don't know if it was MERS or the, or the first version of SARS, there'd been some scare. 
uh, and some significant outbreak. And, and that alerted the country and New York State in particular to the, to the dangers of pandemics. And, and they said, you know what, we, we need a stockpile of ventilators and masks. And they actually, they had a lot of the stuff that became relevant um, during this pandemic. They had realized that it would be important stuff to have. And they had, and they put, I don't know, it was, a, it was some tens of millions of dollars that they invested in this on a yearly basis to, to acquire and maintain a stockpile. But then the financial crisis came along of 2008 and 2009, and that number was reduced to a, a minimal amount, which was now described as just maintaining, so no longer acquiring. So that was, you know, the fiscal crisis came and went. There was a two or three year period where the, the state budget was really tight. But then the economy came back, the state went back to more or less normal budgeting situation, and they never picked up, they never went back to the stockpile and said, okay, we need to um, turn that back on, uh, refresh what's in there. And I mean, I've been, I've been trying to think of, you know, what mechanisms can you put in place to, uh, to prevent that kind of thing from happening again? I mean, I think the idea that Senator Serino said of having a separate hearing on the public health budget, at least members could ask on, a, on an annual basis, what's going on with the stockpile? What's the condition of the stockpile, if, if they cared? Um, I think another idea that I've been toying around with is the idea of creating some kind of um, a branch of the health department that's sort of focused on global threats and has a kind of dashboard. And so on a routine basis, it's putting out a report. Here is the state, here's our state of preparedness and here is the state of risk from pandemics. And they would, and they would report directly to the public. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have to go be filtered through a PIO or any, a public information officer or the governor's office. It would, it would be a report directly to the public. And so at least if, if the pandemic was getting, if the stockpile was getting old and out of date, or if it was miss, or if they hadn't acquired a certain item that this, that this organization thought it should have, the public would, you know, at least theoretically be aware of it. Members of the legislature could, could, be aware of it, and the media could talk about it. I'm not. I don't know if that would necessarily fix things permanently, but as things stand now, it's kind of a black box. I mean, when when people first started asking for information about the pandemic, they were told by the governor's office, "We don't share information about the stockpile," um, as if it was a like a national defense secret or something. Um, so I, I mean, it sounds a little easy, but I think transparency would. Have, having a structure whose purpose is to keep us informed about our state of readiness and transparency about the state of readiness might help. You know, Bill, I agree with you when you talk about, like we talked a lot about transparency and communication. And I, I remember, I think it was during one of the governor's press conferences when he was asked about the stockpile, he said it was not adequate because he, he had spent money to bolster it with um, no crisis on the horizon. So like if he would have spent the money, he would have been criticized for spending taxpayer dollars, right? That way or something to that effect. And I, I guess I think that was a fair concern at the time because nobody could have predicted this pandemic. And there may have been um, some criticism at a time when we were facing a significant budget deficit, as you know. However, I think this pandemic has proven there really is a smart way to use our resources efficiently to ensure we have the supplies ready when we need them. You know, and it may not be so much a question of a stockpile, which we know can sometimes go to waste, but a better understanding of the key supply chains that we have in place right now and what we need to do to ensure that they keep working effectively if ever another crisis comes our way. And this is something that an independent review would also bring about a better understanding of. You know, I remember during the pandemic, I had a guy that made, this is just an example, right, a local person made uh, dental supplies, and he said he could make 
a, a valve that would help increase uh, the ventilators, you know, to use the ventilator for maybe four people, those kind of things that, you know, we need to explore and need to know that we could have those local resources as well. And as you see, like all over where we have a problem with the uh, supply chain right now, and I think it's something that we need to have more of a focus and a better understanding of. I'd like to sort of second that idea of, of the supply chain. Um, I think, you know, the stock, we need to be a little realistic about us, what a stockpile can do. A stockpile is not going to be able to supply the entire healthcare system through the, a prolonged uh, global pandemic. A stockpile is really a, a bridge to some sort of regular supply. And I think we learned that that's, that's where things really fell down in this, in this response. And you had basically states and cities and hospital systems competing against each other and against the federal government for a supply that for the most part had been moved offshore. And uh, there, were, there were problems with actually moving supplies into this country. Uh, and I think it, this, that's really an issue that I don't think New York can deal with <laughs> by itself. Uh, I think that's an issue that we need a national plan and, and a national scalable capacity to, to build and, and make the, the supplies that we need in a crisis in, within the country and under, under some sort of a centralized distribution plan, because otherwise you end up with each, each uh, hospital, each state, each local government, you know, trying to outcompete the others and, and competing against foreign countries uh, for, for supplies. So I think you know, we can talk about the stockpile. I think it would be helpful to understand how the stockpile was used or wasn't used. Um, I think there are, you know, it's it's not like the stockpile wasn't being managed, and we could talk about the steps that were like shelf life extension that were utilized to to keep, and that's why some of the supplies were kept because it was believed that they would still be useful and workable. Um, but I think ultimately, what you know, the stockpile is is only a bridge to. In a, in a pandemic that's going to last months and years, the stockpile is only a short bridge to try and get to a stable supply situation, which maybe, maybe we're at now. I, we haven't heard about supply shortages lately, uh, <laughs> although now we have the whole new dynamic of, of uh, supply chain problems, which may be affecting PPE and ventilators and other things I don't know. But uh, that, that's really, I think, where things collapsed in the initial responses. There was not a national plan or, or national capacity even to produce needed supplies. And that, that really requires a federal response. Yeah, I just wanna acknowledge I'm hearing um, from the audience, it sounds like we've got um, several, several kinds of audience members, including staff at local departments and from hospitals and nursing homes who are all sort of saying, I've got five comments here from folks that are agreeing that they felt like they were locked out of the process that this, uh, this idea of communication and being able to know what's going on and be able to actively participate um, was something that was a barrier for them. Um, Sarah, I don't know if, you, if, if your members were hearing this particularly during the process, but how, what, what are some other ways to move that forward in terms of increasing that communication side? Yeah. And, you know, just to be forthright, you know, NYSHO has a long standing relationship with the State Department of Health. Um, you know, we've always worked in partnership and collaboratively. And yes, there were certainly communication challenges, uh, particularly during the initial phases of the pandemic. Um, but during that time, we did work with key players um, from the Department of Health and we maintained communication with them. Um, but as we learned in the testimony in the report that came out, um, there were often times where the State Department of Health didn't have insight into some of the things that uh, was being announced by the executive during his briefings, um, you know, executive orders, rules, regulations. Um, so we were we were finding out along with the department at the, at the same time. And then um, when it, what made that so challenging is um, we receive calls from the public uh, and then we don't have answers. And then days later, the guidance comes and it's really challenging um, to message and, um, you know, relieve the public from any concern that they might have. And while the Department of Health appears to have been under constraints in their communication with the local health departments, I, I do think they worked incredibly hard to provide ongoing information um, throughout the pandemic to the greatest extent that they could. Um, but 
moving forward, you know, yesterday was uh, Dr. Bassett's first day as health commissioner. Um, we're really, really excited about that. She has a lot of great expertise in Article 6 in health equity, um, working at New York City Depart Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and we need to, you know, meet with her, strengthen our relationship with her, and work collaboratively to prepare for the next pandemic. Um, communication is key here. And uh, with all transitions taking place at the state, um, we need to find a way to, to have a more aligned approach to public health response. Yeah, I mean, and and of course, it's easy to focus on some of the negative things that came out of this, but there's also other reasons to communicate this, right? And we just got a comment from uh, somebody who's an administrator of a nursing home where they didn't have a death during the initial stages of COVID, right? And so the easier it is to get those stories and share information, that's obviously very important. Um, so part of what we're thinking about on the supply chain issues is, is there's uh, government as a procurer and then there are manufacturers and opening that supply line up as well. Um, Bill, I don't know if you wanna tackle this, but thinking about how to better engage um, producers on the side of how do we make sure the stockpiles are right and, and what were there missed opportunities um, in terms of keeping the stockpile obviously to date, but then engaging um, producers in that process to make it happen quicker, or more efficiently, or? You know, I actually, I heard a story about this um, recently. At some point pretty early on, the, the uh, Empire State Development offered grants to encourage people to become PPE manufacturers. And a bunch of companies took those grants. It was, you know, millions of dollars. And they went out and they became you know, they, they bought the equipment and they set up to become PPE manufacturers. But in order to sell PPE, you need approval from a couple of federal agencies, uh, CDC, CDC or CMS, and then also NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And that process is enormously difficult and time consuming to the point that it took them the better part of a year in some cases. So they had this just emergency situation. They had overwhelming demand. The state had given them the startup money and they spent months spinning their wheels. I mean, I think they were able to sell some equipment. They, they couldn't sell it to healthcare settings or they couldn't use certain terms like N95 and things like that. But that, I mean, that kind of points to a problem at the federal level that, you know, the, the bureaucracy that is involved in regulating PP couldn't turn it up to a new gear in the middle of a national crisis. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so I think that that drives home the point about the supply chain being more of a national issue. I mean, I think it turned out, uh, I mean, this is going to be an oversimplification, but the, the, the critical shortages of PP, at least in New York State, turned out to be a pretty short-term phenomenon, if only because our, our spike thankfully ended when it did. That first wave came to, it, it became much more manageable uh, in May and, and, and dropped to a very low level over the summer. Um, so really, we it was that short term period where we just had this overwhelming demand and nobody had any supply. That's when the, the, the stockpile could and should and, and maybe was useful. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, you do have to uh, depend on manufacturers to gear up their output and meet the demand. And Bill, you you know you bring up really good points, and again, it goes to the communication issue, right? I remember there were a number of times during the pandemic when I had local producers came to us and said, "Hey, we can produce this, we can produce that," and um, but we don't have a contact. And then we would contact our person, our liaison at the governor's office, and then we'd get no reply back. But yet you had so many people that were willing and able to do things, but 
no no response, no communication. And I think it, it really boils down to that. And, I, and I'm another firm believer why we need this review. And I think um, the next time that we has to be a better system to get that information up the chain because we had the resources on the ground, but they weren't being um, fully uh, utilized. So that like that brings to mind, I mean, this this was a national story, but there was a, uh, I, I don't remember what line of business he was in. He was named Oren Pines. I believe he was somehow involved in the tech world. And at some point he responded to a tweet from President Trump and said, and the tweet wasn't even about the pandemic, but he said, I have access to some ventilators, somebody get in touch with me. Well, somebody in the White House saw that tweet, got in touch with him, passed his name along to Governor Cuomo. And the next thing you know, New York State is negotiating with this guy. And I think, I don't think he ended up being able to deliver the ventilators. And there's a big legal dispute over what happened to the money. But I think it's interesting that you couldn't get through with your lead on a, on a supplier in New York State. But this guy, Oren Pines, who you know tweets at the president, he got the governor's attention. And that does seem very dysfunctional. <laughs> it, it was extremely dysfunctional and really disheartening because like I said before, you know, our constituents look to us for the answers. And then when we reach out to the governor's office, there's no communication. There's just a micromanagement that has proven to not work. And uh, it was uh, very disappointing. And uh, it was just, you know, so, so amazing because it was re it really even like a mystery how we were even getting some of the goods that we were getting. So, um, you know, that's why I think we really, you, know, you brought up a big, a good point too, um, that we need an audit too to know where those funds went. And I think that's another huge part of this. Uh, and part of this investigation bill, as you know, I've been talking about for a long time. And, uh, you know, I have a, a bill that would actually do that uh, for the audit. So, and I'd like to see that move forward. Part of what, and, and panelists, feel free to jump in with questions too. I'm, I'm working off of our audience question list right now. Um, thinking more specifically about what's going to be coming up, um, you know, not knowing how bad this next brand is going to be, um, with a, a pretty high vaccination rate in the state, um, the concept of going back into a lockdown or being further restrictive on, on the way people can move and do things, uh, it seems to be coming up more. So what's what's changed in that sense in terms of, you know, what, what should people be thinking about and expecting and, and what role does maybe the state play in that um, as we think about obviously protecting people, but making sure we don't go back to a scenario where, um, you know, you're, you're locked up in your house or, or whatever to that extent. I think more local control with their local health departments. I think that's huge. They didn't have that before. You know, there are certain regions of the state that are experiencing um, higher COVID rates than others. And I think that local control really comes into play. Com communication, transparency. You know, I, I was very encouraged when our new governor took over and she said that she wants to govern by listening, which is something that I've always said too. I, that's how I learn things. Um, and I'm. this is a... Uh, time when she can uh, really put that forward by listening to the local health departments and working with them on some of their suggestions on what should be done. Thanks for that, Senator. And, you know, I'll just say that I hope that the public is listening to their county health departments because they really do have your best interest and in, in health in mind um, when they're making these recommendations. Trust me, no one wants another lockdown or another a ma mandate, but they make these decisions based on the situation in your community. If there's a high case um, rate in your community, a low vaccination rate, they're doing what's in the best interest for everybody residing in, in that area. Area. So um, I guess this is a good time to plea if anybody has not um, gone out and talked to their provider or local county health department about getting vaccinated, today's the perfect day to do it. So uh, I, I would just second that. I think, I think, you know, our vaccination rates are okay, but they're not great. Uh, and most of the surge we're seeing now is among unvaccinated people. Uh, we'll have to see whether Omicron about how, what 
protection that Omicron provides. But I think the good news so far, at least, is that the vaccines and the level of vaccination we've achieved, which I think is not at herd immunity, obviously, but it has it has protected the, the acute care healthcare system from being totally overwhelmed. Um, and that that's part of part of the goal. It hasn't kept people from getting sick. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think I would agree with Sarah. The, the message still to people is if you want to avoid the necessity of shutdowns in order to protect our you know, functioning of our healthcare system, uh, vaccination is, is the way to do that. On the question of local departments, I think the, there's also a in, in, in some ways kind of a flip side in that I, I think often local departments and, and, and school boards and, and others uh, were looking to the health to the state health department for guidance. Uh, you know, maybe they were looking for the state health department to be telling them what to do so that they would have uh, you know, a little political cover locally if they were doing something un unpopular. Uh, so I, I think I think the question of relying on local departments uh, also involves uh, the state department uh, providing guidance to them, and uh, and and if that if that guidance also serves the function of political cover, uh, you know, so be it. But they've got a state and local need to be working together. You know, I agree wholeheartedly on that. And, you know, I, speaking to the counties that I represent, you know, they said that they had adequate resources and adequate staff, but they found that the state's uh, micromanaging was really counterproductive. That was a big part of the problem. I think, like you said, they really need to work together more, so. I am. Um... This isn't necessarily the same situation now, but um, back in March, or at least shortly after the decision to do the shutdown, there were media interviews and, and comments from the governor in which he said he had to move slowly and he had to move carefully because he had to bring the public along. He was concerned that if he issued an edict that it would be widely disregarded or widely violated and there'd be no practical way for him to enforce it. So that he, he was sort of, he was focused on this dynamic of not getting too far ahead of the public. And the thing that, I mean, there, there are different metrics that people have looked at. One is mobile phone data to, to, to track the mobility of people. And that shows that New Yorkers became dramatically less mobile starting on around March 5th. The, the, there was just this, this dramatic drop off in people leaving their homes basically and, and, and going around the city um, weeks before anybody told them that that was necessary. At, at the time, um, the governor and the mayor were saying, don't panic, cough into your sleeve, wash your hands. Uh, but otherwise go about your lives as usual. They, they didn't start ordering any kind of uh, restriction on, on large gatherings until mid-March and they didn't do the close down until late March, but the public was already taking those precautions to some extent on their own. And the same, you saw the same with mask wearing. Public health officials were pe telling people not to wear masks and yet mask wearing started climbing again in early March and by the time the shutdown happened, already about 30% of people reported they were wearing masks a lot. And, and the, the governor didn't actually recommend masks or mandate them until uh, mid-April. So um, I think in that situation anyway, in those early days when there was a certain amount of uh, fear and panic in the public, they were taking the steps they felt were necessary. And I think they were ready to listen to, to the advice that public health officials were giving them. And maybe the next time um, public, public officials, especially you know, governors and elected officials should keep that in mind that the public may well be already ahead of them on some of these things. That, I don't know that that would still happen now. Um, I mean, I think we've gotten to a point now where people who believe in masks are wearing masks and people who believe in vaccines are using vaccines. And 
what the government tells you to do doesn't necessarily change that that much at this point in the in the in the story. Now, this all comes back to um, communication. Risk communication is something that um, I think that we can take a look at and evaluate and see how it worked and what what didn't work and and provide training to um, you know county electeds and, and county health officials to make sure that they're explaining things. Hey, this is the news today. Um, this could change. And that's one of the challenging things about COVID is that um, when it, when we were first learning about it, uh, you know, a lot of the symptom and, and spread type behavior of COVID-19 was very similar to flu. And so we had to wait for that information to come out, um, you know, from the CDC and, and World Health Organization uh, before we could. And, and there were some mistakes made along the way, of course. Um, so risk communication is certainly something that you have to be proficient in uh, to be able to communicate with the public effectively. So switching gears just slightly, here's an interesting question from the audience. Um, um, somebody's saying that they've heard the way the federal budgeting for pandemics work um, causes problems because it's tied to national security agencies rather than directly to public health agencies, um, which is part of the reason that they scale back on pandemic preparation. Um, does, does anybody know if that's right? And if it is, um, what kind of impact is that actually having, did it have in New York um, in 2020 and 2021? I have no idea. All right, we got stumped, I like it. <laughs> I, there, there are so many different types of funding that we could be talking about, right? Um, a, a lot coming from CDC and then emergency preparedness funding for counties, CARES Act funding. So it, it, it really is um, complex <laughs> what's coming down from the federal level. I know for the, the federal funding that goes down to localities, it, it goes through the state. And we're lucky because um, in New York State, the State Department of Health has always been a great partner and is willing to, um, you know, take some of that money and then shoot it out to the local health departments. Um, but in other states, I know that that is not always the case. The state will keep the funding and not um, distribute it. Yeah, so I just comment in my experience, the federal funding that supports public health preparedness comes through CDC. And I, I'm not aware that it's tied although maybe in backdoor backroom negotiations in Congress, it's tied to the funding of other agencies. But I, I do think this idea of global health security where public health crises like a pandemic become a national security is actually a good, a good thing. Uh, in the previous, you know, before Trump came in, I believe Obama actually set up on the National Security Council a global health security position to, to precisely to look at the, both the national security as well as the public health impacts of, of things happening, you know, potential pandemics and other diseases internationally. And that, that position was removed under Trump. Um, so I, I do think there's an advantage of thinking about things like a pandemic as a, as a, health, as a, as a national security issue, because it is. Uh, it's impacted our economy tremendously, worse, worse than any war that you could imagine at this point. So, uh, but in that vein, those, those security agencies should be working hand in hand, not in competition with the public health agencies at the federal level. And I, I'm not aware that funding has been, you know, affected such, such that public health funding was less because that funding went to the national security apparatus. I, I don't know about that, but uh, I will say the pattern of federal funding is crisis driven. We had 9-11, we had a big chunk of money that went away. Then we had smallpox, a big chunk of money that went away. Then we had H1N1, big chunk of new money that went away. So it's very cyclical and we don't, we don't seem to learn that we need to have sort of a basic base level of, of funding to maintain capacity. Um, basically states and the locals who the states fund are, are left scrambling every time you know, the crisis fades, the funding fades, and then you're back back to square one. So reversing that pattern of funding from the federal level, who's the primary funder of, of uh, public health preparedness, I think would really go a long way towards helping, helping stabilize things. Yeah, and I think that's one of the points we were trying to make 
earlier is how do we prevent getting back into this space? Um, we've got a lot of questions sort of on what a public commission or an investigation would look like. Um, Bill, I know you've thought about this a little bit. Um, I mean, just talk to us a little bit how you, what you sort of envision something like this would be, and then maybe we can discuss the finer points of that. You know, uh, how does it work? Who calls it? What, are the, what does the membership of a commission look like? And, and then ultimately, what's the final outcome of it? Well, so the analogy I draw is to the National Transportation Safety Board. This is this is the federal organization that comes in after plane crashes and other and train crashes and things like that. And they they look at the black box and they look at the the wreckage of the plane and they analyze all the recordings they can find in the flight path. They go back through the the sleep history and the alcohol consumption history of everybody involved and they really try to figure out what factors came together to cause that particular plane crash and then learn what systems failed here. Uh, you know, they may end up deciding that pilot error was part of the problem, but is there a way we can build a system around that pilot so that that error is impossible anymore? And it's that, and, it, and it's also that, like, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I don't believe that they get involved in any kind of criminal ramifications, right? Like they, they may decide that somebody was improperly drunk when they were running a train, but that that's like, how do we prevent people from becoming drunk is their problem, not how do we punish the guy for being drunk. Um, and I, I think that's the spirit that this could be done in. I mean, I, again, there's, there's a place for holding people accountability. I don't object to that. I think to some extent that's going on, but this, this, there, there's also a need for one that's kind of, uh, you know, focused on being constructive and learning lessons. Um, in terms of the structure, I mean, I at one point last year, I thought it should be just com completely organic out of the private sector, that it should have no, the state shouldn't come close to it. I mean, at that point, you you know, gov the, Governor Cuomo was still governor and um, his health department was in a mode of, of defending every last thing that had happened because it was the absolute best thing that could have happened. And um, so I just felt like just for simple credibility reasons, it needed to be coming from outside of that, uh, the, the sphere of influence of, of the Cuomo administration. Um, since we now have a new administration, I feel like we've kind of wiped that slate clean. We have a new health commissioner. Um, so I, I, I feel like there, it probably it makes better sense to have direct involvement of the executive branch and the health department, also the legislature. I think you want to make it, yeah, you want to make it bipartisan. You want to, you want to, um, you want to pick people based on their credentials rather than their political, political affiliations. Um, I will admit it's not something that happens every day. And I'm sure when it does happen, people will find things to pick and, and complain about. But I still think it's worth doing because if nothing else, it will, if you give them a mandate, come back with a plan to fix the public health system. The legislature will then be confronted with a plan and the media will be confronted with the plan and the public will. And they'll be able to decide, did, they actually implement this plan. You know, like it'll 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 be a baseline for discussion. They'll say this is how much money different agencies need, and this is the equipment they need, and this is the authority they need. And we can judge from that whether the the elected officials have suitably followed up. The other component I would recommend be included is uh, New York State has several really superb schools of public health. And I think, I think that's a resource that, uh, you know, has, has high credibility, is, is not involved in, uh, in, in the politics of things, uh, and, and, and provides real expertise, including many people who have, uh, who have experience in, in government and, and in public health. Uh, um, as well as being academics. Um, so I, I, I think having a, a significant chunk of the membership of a commission uh, being schools of public health 
uh, makes a lot of sense. Yep, and uh, Bill too, I think, you know, like having nonpartisan organizations also as well, like the Empire Center and uh, like assembly, assembly member mentioned educational centers, healthcare, long-term um, care professionals, and actually maybe even some of the former Department of Health employees, because they're going to bring um, a kind of a unique perspective to all of this. And I know I talked about the structure before I made some suggestions, but with a special appointee, but they do need that subpoena power, because we need to be sure that they can access all of the information that they need to really produce a well-informed report. And uh, credentials are so key with this. Um, and then I think also maybe somebody from the business community to be able to speak to how the policies actually impacted our economy and what worked and maybe what went a little bit too far. Uh, I think it you know, should be a pretty broad spectrum of uh, those kind of people involved. School associations, local health departments worked hand in hand with their schools during this time. That, right. that would be key. The, the local voice is going to be key. And I think that, um, you know, if the state's putting together a, a commission, it should mirror some of the partnerships that local health departments have in their own communities. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know we covered this a little bit, um, and, and I'd like to say it again, because I think it's important. I mean, it sounds like there's consensus that it's a good idea to have this commission and assemblyman, you'd sort of pointed out the political reality that it's hard to fund something like that against competing priorities. Um, but I mean, I, it's important. It, pro it probably definitely needs to be done. Um, so how do, we, how do we do that? What are, you know, how do you create that consensus and, and the list to get it up to the top of the priority list, whether it's through the budget process or otherwise? Um, you know, what are those missing components just on a little further reflection maybe? Well, getting various significant voices coming together uh, on a proposal and urging the legislature to include it in the budget. Uh, voices like uh, schools of public health, um, advocacy groups, uh, newspaper editorials, uh, you know, that's how ideas gain momentum. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I sort of naively thought that this would sort of happen automatically, you know, that, that it was such a traumatic event that it, that the natural response would be, we need an investigative commission. Um, I mean, we've, we've talked about, Dr. Brookhead just talked about how cyclical public health funding tends to be. And, and unfortunately, the cycle comes after the crisis, right? So you have a crisis, money flows in, sometimes too late to help with the crisis, but it's, it's you know, sort of ex post facto. And then the crisis dies down, people go back to not thinking about public health and pandemics until the next one comes along. In this case, I mean, we, we have thrown a lot of money at the pandemic, but it hasn't been thrown at the public health system. It's been thrown at, you know, supporting people in their lives and, and, and replacing lost revenue and, and other important priorities. And uh, I'm just surprised. I mean, the same thing is happening in Washington. You know, the, 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 there's been some sort of minor discussion about having a 9-11 type commission, but it hasn't gotten off the ground. Um, there was some panel that recommended a big investment in public health infrastructure. The, the, the president accepted the report. He included a big allocation for it in, the, uh, in one of the bills, I think the Build Back Better bill. But then as, as that bill was negotiated, the, the amount of money dwindled to a, a tiny fraction of what was originally proposed. Um, I, I think part of the problem is that there's so many other people with um, competing ideas for what we should be spending money on. And there, I mean, even in the context of Washington, there's a limited amount of money that they're willing to spend. And uh, I, I, it, it would just be a shame. I mean, we, we do have an influx of federal aid right now. We have a political moment where people care about the public health system. And it would just be a, a tragedy if we let it pass without 
you know, actually using some of those resources and that political moment to, to make a real change in the public health system. I have no idea how many zeros there should be in the budget of that commission. <laughs> Are we and talking hundreds of thousands? You have a bidding war. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think a really important thing to, uh, to think about is the public really has the power here. And I think building public support and ensuring uh, New Yorkers understand the importance of this is really key to making it a reality. Uh, you know, they, they want answers, right? And I think that's uh, going to be a lot to play. Like the public is listening to this today and, and many people that have skin in the game. And I think that we need to push for this. There is extra money that we had from the federal government and we should be able to utilize those funds, um, you know, to really have true transparency and um, find out where we went wrong, right? We don't want to have, we don't want to repeat these same problems over and over again. So I think this is so important. And that's why, you know, um, Bill, the Empire Center. I, I can't thank you guys enough for doing this today. It was uh, very, very helpful, I, I believe. So I'm going to shift gears again. We're getting um, uh, several questions, and, and I think maybe, Dr. Burkhead, this would, this would be for you for starters, I hope. Um, thinking about, you know, Bill talked about that initial jump in numbers, Cuomo's mountain, and then sort of the pre-mountain that was before that, and then the impact that the shutdown had and the stay-home orders and the quarantines, and, and thinking again about, and I sort of asked a similar question before, but thinking about the vaccines playing a role and, and how this is all morphed, what, how, how do we reconcile those things moving forward? Thinking about the economic impact, um, obviously we all felt and saw what happened when we were when it when when we were shut down when the economy was shut down and we want to weigh being safe with with making sure that we don't you know tank the economy essentially um so part of this is you know the at-risk populations and and sarah talked a little bit about the communication side of this and making sure people understand um why they should be vaccinated and and what that would look like but how do we weigh those two things as we move forward with this, as we think about the next phase of the virus and, and respecting those two things? What, you know, do you see anything that, you know, maybe where there were missteps or where we learned lessons and, and how do we apply that as we move into whether it's the next strand or whatever pandemic comes next? I know. Well, I, I'm not sure I have any uh terribly insightful answers. One, one, one answer is I think this pandemic has shown us the impact of health inequities and the, the importance of the social determinants of health. So you, you ask why, why did minority communities, why were they so heavily impacted? Why are they still uh, reluctant to uh, you know, take vaccination, for example? And I think there's a, there's a whole area there that we could, we could delve into about how, how to do to do that better, which starts with gaining the trust in, in those communities, but, but also gets to the social and economic uh, impacts here. So if, if you live in a multi-generational home with a limited space available and you have to, you are an essential worker, you have to go to work, um, how do you follow the recommendations to uh, you know, try to work from home if possible, to avoid public transportation? If you're feeling ill, isolate yourself in your home with a separate bathroom, uh, keep away from other, I mean, the, just the, the social economic factors there for a whole segment of the population that can't comply with any of those things. And then you add on to that the distrust of, of years of, of discrimination uh, and episodes like Tuskegee lead people to avoid vaccination. I think that's a whole area that even if the, the whole response had gone swimmingly, those, those factors would still have impacted who got sick uh, and where we are today with, with you know, still large segments of the population under vaccination. So, so partly it's a communication issue, partly it's, it's uh, establishing a trust or reestablishing trust in these communities, but it's also dealing with other issues like uh, you know, housing as an issue, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, how to care for the essential workforce uh, when you have a situation like this. I think those are all all uh, areas which I don't know that we've solved those problems yet. And if we had another pandemic, they probably the same things might play out again. So, how do we make progress on those sorts of issues? I think is 
is is a, a big concern I think going forward. And then I haven't even mentioned sort of the polarization that's arisen and the and the political polarization. I don't know how you fight that. Uh, and I'm I'm concerned also that if we did this did a redo of this pandemic in five or ten years that that would immediately resurface because uh, that's what's in people's memory. So I think we face a number of difficulties uh, of communication. Uh, you know, also, uh, you know, I think dealing with with the health inequities in general and and social determinants of health are sort of the key in, in pu any public health approach to trying to improve the resilience of populations going forward. So I, that was a little bit of a rambling response, but uh, I think there are a lot of issues there that I'm not sure I know the answers to, but we still need a lot of work and they don't, they don't fall back on, you know, what's the plan? Did we follow the plan? It's really, how do we deal with issues like this, which are longstanding and, and really fundamental? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm impressed it took us an hour and 50 minutes to bring up the, the political ramifications and polarization that are, that are the outcome of this, but I'd be interested to hear from some of the other panelists um, on that and, and the impact that that's had and, and what that means moving forward. So, I mean, I had, I had a thought about this that Mr. Godfrey brought up earlier, the, um, the Ebola situation where, where you had this enormously scary and dangerous disease. It did arrive on our shores. It was in New York City. It could have gone much, much worse. And it was well controlled. And as a result, there was no need for shutdowns. There was no need for masking. The vulnerable communities who would have suffered disproportionately had Ebola broken out did not suffer. And it's important to convey that. Like, I think now when we talk about a strengthened public health system, people are immediately thinking, oh my God, it's gonna mean more mask wearing and shutdowns. And it's exactly the opposite of that. A more effective public health system means we never get to the point of having, or hopefully never get to the point of shutdowns and mask wearing. Or if we do, it's gonna be more targeted and shorter term than it had to be in this situation. Um, uh, it's a tricky thing to sell politically because it's stuff that's not happening, right? Like the, it's, it's, it's this, it's, not, it, but, but like, like I say, this is one of those moments, this particular moment in history, when I think people would get that, people would get that prevent, how important prevention is and how important management and, and, and minimizing things are. And it, so the ideal outcome would be to use that moment and the resources that are sitting there to build some kind of long-term structure that would implement that principle, even if we forget about it going forward. And I think also on, on, on the politics, I, I think New York is in probably a, a better position in terms of our local politics uh, to take public health seriously than some other states, which shall go nameless. Well, you don't have, I mean, the, 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 the dominant political culture in New York is not um, skeptical of vaccines and they're, they, they have not resisted the mask wearing and the other restrictions the way no. other states have. And that's a totally fair point. I mean, I, I would also point out as I said in my presentation, we are, for better or worse, more vulnerable than other parts of the country. We, it's because we are lucky enough to have tourists coming to visit us on a regular basis. And we do have a dense urban environment and we have Broadway shows and basketball games and mass transit. Uh, I mean, we have to be more vigilant about this stuff or we're not gonna, be viable as a as a place to live. Yep. Yeah, I think I mean, maybe we've got time for one more. Um, I'll start. I'll start this question with Sarah. It's popped up two or three times. Um, as we think about creating plans for the future, state hopefully will have a commission. Um, and we're going to learn from that. They're going to create some plans. And then there is this, I mean, this has come up several times, even among the panelists, there's this push and pull between state and local and, and sort of, you know, who's 
holding the reins and how do we push that? So even among your members, Sarah, I don't, I'm sure you're, they're thinking and talking about this. What's the right order for that? What part, how much of it's coming from the state and how much of it's coming from the, from the county or the town level? Yeah, there are going to be um, situations where, um, for example, travel across international borders where you have to take a state approach. We all have to be on lock, in lockstep and following the same guidance on that. And then, um, you know, there may be guidance that allows the locality to make a decision about face masks indoor, uh, indoors based on the, the rates of COVID that they have in, the, in their county. Um, from my members' perspective, it is um, much easier to handle guidance when it's all consistent. Um, or at least fo following a framework with rates in it. Um, you know, you're in this level when your case rates are here um, and, and, and the state really directing that. The state provides guidance and we follow and implement that guidance locally. Um, I think what's, what's important is that the way that the guidance is developed needs to be communicated with us and, and develop transparently so that we fully understand it and commu can communicate it to the public. Um, and, and so we've seen, um, for example, there was guidance released on high risk sports. Um, each, each region took a different approach to how they were handling that um, in schools. And it, it made it very challenging when um, one county is doing something and your neighboring county is is uh, is not do, taking the same approach because you have people living in one county going to school in another county and vice versa. You uh, generally prefer to see consistent guidance um, from the state so that we can kind of all be coordinated in, in implementation locally. Yeah, and I, and I think that um... I'll, I'll make my final pitch, right? Um, certainly getting those processes uh, sort of solidified and, and learning from what has happened and using that as an opportunity to move all of this forward, especially why it's fresh would be really, really important for that. Um, so we're at the end of our time. Uh, I think this was, a, this was a great conversation. We sometimes worry about being able to fill up a whole time slot. And I think you guys were great. We have uh, literally dozens of unanswered questions, uh, which we will review and we'll get back to all of you um, uh, who put your names on them. Um, so thank you to our panelists. This was great. This was really instructive. Um, I think it gives us a lot to work off of and move forward on. And, and hopefully this continues to be a big part of the conversation as we move into the next legislative session. So thank you very much. <laughs>